Good morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, I think it's been a, a great start. And thank you, Charu and Prerna, for putting it together and giving us this opportunity to, to be here today. Uh, since I have already had my introduction uh, read out uh, very graciously by somebody, I just request my co panelists to choose some subject. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Malik Shah. I am heading supply chain function at ECM Shriram Limited. We are in chemical, fertilizer, and sugar industry. Uh, good morning. I'm Pritam Banerjee. I'm currently a logistics and construction consultant in the Asia Development Bank. Uh, I think I have a little bit of a unique situation because long years back, you know, multiple things in my life, long years back I was in the World Bank in Washington DC, working on FBI, so the other side. As senior director for Deutsche Post Gaisel Group subsequently, I was one of the freight forwarders filling that questionnaire. And now with ADB, I have been working on many of the initiatives that uh, we mentioned. So and I have won all, all kinds of hats, so I hope I can be adding some value to the conversation today. I think my name is here. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I am Vilo Sharma uh, from Triple FAI. And, uh, I studied my journey nine years before uh, in Triple FA in logistics. I moved last for 35 years. And uh, I studied in Triple FA as a treasurer for four years, then vice chairman, and now I'm serving uh, as a secretary, aspiring for uh, further posts in the logistics to serve the industries. Thank you very much. This one's working. Okay, good. Thank you. So, uh, so we have a, a great panel uh, panelists with us today, and uh, all from very interesting uh, part of the supply chain ecosystem, I should say. So we have a user, we have a consultant, we have I don't know how to describe them. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a very balanced uh, panel, and uh, first I have to uh, also thank the learnings we have today from General Saab, uh, putting us uh, in in a reality check, okay, because a lot of us talk a lot about jargon in supply chain, and uh, I just sort of correlated what he said is from the old Mahabharata days about Arjunji, where in that fish uh, competition, he forgot about everything else and just focused on the eye of the fish. And I think as business leaders, if we stay, stay true to our path and our vision and our goal, I think chances of success are greater. So that is one. And uh, the second thing, uh, I think Charu today is a difficult day because it's just after budget. So we're all having overflow of information from all directions. But I just happened to read this morning's ET, which talks about the Sapta Rishis. Okay. And, uh, Happy to see that some of those Sapta Rishis which were quoted today actually also engage supply chain and logistics. So for those of you who have not read it, I'll just quickly talk to you a little bit about that. Right. So so this is the first budget I'm, uh, in the Amrit Kaal, as announced by the government. And uh, the Sapta Rishis which were inclusive development, reaching the last mile, infrastructure and investment, Unleashing the potential, green power growth, youth power, and the financial sector. So I think uh, you know some of these points are very closely integrated with our holistic view of supply chains today. So uh, I also would like to thank Mehir for putting together that presentation and setting the context for today's uh, panel discussion. Uh, very, very relevant points and, uh, you know, I think as supply chain leaders, we all see the transformation that India is going through, led by, of course, the leadership, the government, etc. Uh, but here we're going to actually understand what is the truth on the ground, right? So, uh, why, uh, I would just request the panelists to kind of give some opening remarks uh, about their view. 
and then we engage in a one-on-one -on -one or you know a multi-channel discussion and we also open to the house for discussion so first user thank you thank you so from an industry perspective whatever uh, from the morning we are uh, hearing that we are on the right track we are improving on infrastructure we are serious about the logistic cost as well as the last mile delivery and reach uh, but still uh, the, the uh, theme of uh, uh, mine uh, will be the pace uh, because you know today we are planning to reach to the five figure uh, uh, economy in 2025 and we are already in 2023 and uh, as we said uh, though we are working on the logistic government is working on the logistic from last so many years but now we are uh, really engaging on the uh, more infrastructure development and uh, the last point delivery and partnering the logistic companies also and getting views so as an industry i feel that the pace is still not as required. So that will be my theme for today. Thank you. Thank you. First, let me start by uh, expressing my gratitude for uh, you know, channel of energy for making me here. So very briefly, if I may, uh, and this takes off from you know, uh, this wonderful presentation. One very important thing is so focusing on the API itself. Let us not forget that it is perception. Since I say this, and that's why I started saying the, the introduction that I have been on both the sides, I have been inside the World Bank, looking at the results that have come in from the surveys. And then at one point in my life, I've actually filling in these surveys. You know, what people typically remember when they fill out these surveys is their most recent experience. And the most recent experience can often be driven by a single point of problem. I mean, if we are supply chain managers, we all know this. So, and this is where I think the government is working on, because you have to address those single points. So, is that one single choke, right? So, I might have a fantastic highway leading all the way up to JNPT or to Petra Point. But the last 20 kilometers, there is one single choke point which holds up my truck for six hours. That's what is in my mind. That's what's driving my response to that. So, you know, when we think about all these big programs, what is, and in fact, one of the subject issues being last mile, you know, understood broadly, is this both last mile in both in terms of the infrastructure, in Prime Minister's decision, they being able to identify precisely these two points, these intermodal, you know, uh, points where things are changing between modes, the gateways to address those, and also in terms of policy. So, just one example, and we will come back to a more detailed discussion, what Mihir mentioned about GST and trucks. We know that GST has made some, but it's still not perfect. There's a lot of problems, trust is still being stopped. Why? Because, and we did some work on this as well, because there are 66 different regulations that apply to a truck moving in India. And these are under seven different departments. Your tax and excise is just being one. So you have just managed to automate and bring some risk management into one. The other six are still outside the purview. As Mihir said, you know, there's multiplicity of agencies. So that's the last mile in regulation that we have to do. So I, I'll stick to this team, perhaps bring some more details as we discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. I think I'll just add on to uh, the, the presentation and also the perspective that I was trying to bring is more around policy and what the government is trying to do. And I think, you know, logistics, if I see from a public sector point of view, is a is not only a central government thing. It is essentially a state government and multi multi agency. So I, I think we have to when we have these conversations, we have to keep that perspective that there are multiple players and a lot of action is actually happening in the state level, uh, which is where all of us have an interface and all that perception that gets reflected as government yes, you know, performance. So I think that's a very strong point of you know angle that we should also have in this uh, conversation. The other is, uh, as Peter mentioned, you know, ultimately all this is perception. Uh, and and I, I remember this line in the report that positive perception is very difficult to print, but negative perception can be immediate and significantly higher in terms of downgrade. So we have to look at this from that lens. Is, is a 
what people think uh, and objectivity I think that is one core element that uh, one would want to have in these kind of elements as to how we make it <coughs> objective from a policy and economic perspective so I think that's my that would be my point Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you Chalu and Prana for bringing us up and speaking about the curse, customs. Right? When you say customs, it's a Sanskrit word is custom. To create a custom, right? Now that, that custom, it's not rolled by the custom to create the custom, right? Now they are facilitating us. What we are seeing in the webinar today, they are, they are interacting with the trade on the large scale with every association, with the every area. Agencies and they want to hear back. And this is a good platform to say the message to the government of India, the Minister of Commerce, Minister of Shipping, and, and they are doing fantastically well. And I don't see any reason that India will not be in top 25 in 2030. Right? We spoke about uh, FBI. This is an extended arm of, uh, say, uh, this is Prime Minister Gandhi Sati. They have taken every point, in, they have taken care of the truckers, they have taken care of the roads, their facilities, what they are going to available for the truckers. So every point they have taken into this. And Ministry of the Finance and the Commerce, which is also another trade body, they really want what are the pain points in, that's what our aim is to send the message to them. So I, I kudos to these the ministries and they are very working hard to get this and there are a lot of strategies but at ground reality there are a lot of challenges that's what we will have to spoke about speak about in that and definitely in my presentation I will speak about those challenges. Thank you. Thank you So, uh, thanks, uh, very interesting. So, um, I will just add my comments to all of this uh, in a very brief manner. Today, actually, we were expecting uh, uh, Mr. Bhardwaj from DPI to DPID to be on this panel, but unfortunately, he's unwell and couldn't attend. So, uh, I will try to touch on some of the points that were actually earmarked for his uh, in, uh, discussion. Uh, but before that, uh, I'd like uh, Pritam to just comment on... So, so before I say that, I think there are broadly three buckets that Mihir had sort of pointed out to us, uh, where the LPI uh, is, is structured around. So one is the infrastructure side, and the other is the services, and the third is the regulation. So on the infrastructure side, uh, I would like Pritam to kindly tell us uh, in his interaction with the government as ADB and, and, and so what are the changes and, and what is the, the road map that the government has put together uh, for the development and improvement of FBI? Thank you Manoj, I think uh, the government plan is not limited. LPI is a metric that you know, as, a, as a government, as a country, you would like to do well in. But it's an overall comprehensive plan to improve logistics and bring down logistics costs. That's the objective. So, uh, in focusing on the infrastructure bit, one thing I think all of us here would agree is a lot of the gateway infrastructure, etc., is increasingly in private sector. Even the major ports are adapting the land, the land got modern. So, a lot of the gateway ports, airports, will be driven by private sector investment. There, the government has been basically adapted a facilitated role where they ensure that the investments are you know, done efficiently and quickly. And you know, from a previous avatar in the private sector, I know that that can also be challenging at times. You know, getting, you know, we were trying to, uh, during my Russia post DHL days, uh, start a facility in the New Delhi airport, and it took us months uh, to get approval. And in fact, one agency uh, ended us up for most of the months. So it was really, it was not huge capex things etc. So there the facilitation of the investment and there as Mir was pointing out in in some cases in the case of the minor boats and many other facilities in the hinterland the state government is an equally important role to play in providing for such a progress where I was in the case to the point. The second part of the infrastructure is the trunk infrastructure, you know, which is your highways, your railways, you know, where the government is in the lead. 
there, I think what the Prime Minister's Delhi Shakti Master Plan aims to do is to use a data-based scientific approach to understand where specific bottlenecks are and also do predictive analysis where you know I have you know we are immediately playing a role. We are, we are developing algorithms using historical traffic data across ports and also in looking at the industrial policy and programs, so you know, where industrial clusters are coming up, where urbanization is taking place. So both for the consumption part as well as the production part. To understand these layers, to do some predictive assessment of where future needs of traffic would be. And therefore inform the development of the infrastructure in that manner. So there's a second arm of it, and again, as we have very rightly pointed out, both the state and the central government does not want to play. So for example, I might have a national highway, or I might have the DFC, but the last mile connectivity to that national highway from the industrial cluster of GFC is the GPS infrastructure. So that coordination is something that is still work in progress. The national layers have been largely achieved, but to onboard the states is, you know, is work in progress and I'm happy to report that the pace is good, but you know, still work in progress. The last, uh, you know, uh, part that I would like to highlight over here is uh, an initiative of the government on the agglomeration. You know, those of us are in supply chain, we know that economies of scale and ability to agglomerate our parcel sizes makes a big difference. Now, we have had organically developed some of these clusters across the country. They work relatively well, but there is an attempt now, keeping in mind the future growth, to develop in advance, that in advance as some countries did, these kind of logistics clusters. So National Highway Logistics Management Limited in HLML, which is a subsidiary of the Ministry of Road Transport, it was in HGI. They have been tasked with identifying 35 nodes and develop multimodal logistics parks. This will be in the private public partnership mode. And the work on the first six of them have started. Uh, and this is actually a big experiment. And why I say it's a big experiment is this, that we are a very price sensitive and I stand to be connected by all, all the very senior industry colleagues over here. We tend to be a very price sensitive economy and rightfully so. Now when we develop an ecosystem of better infrastructure, better quality of services, obviously somebody has to be a little bit The question is what is the market appetite? You know, what's the trade off? Is the quality, better quality, the better services, the, the, the speed, all of those things, how important uh, is it for the user and what somewhat of a premium they're willing to pay for it. Because the, the transition from point zero to the economies of scale, where the prices become extremely competitive, there's a journey. And how quickly you can make that journey is also dependent on the maturity of the industry. But I think we are reaching the inflation point where we will be so, Manji, that's all from my side of the infrastructure. Very thank you so much. Thank you, Preetam. That was uh, very, very informative. So, I'm going to request my colleague here uh, to talk about, you know, he, I think we are all impatient in terms of the speed of development and improvement, right? So, if you had to have a wish list, what would be the top three most important things that you would like to kind of fast forward in the master plan. Thank you, thank you, Manuji. So basically, I'll just start from the uh, point which Prime Minister has said again that the, on the economy. So if we see uh, to reach to that level of economy, then definitely the export is going to be the driver, major driver. Uh, domestic consumption also will have, but the export is going to be the major driver, and for that. In today's world, our logistic cost is not comparable with the world's uh, global standards. So to reduce the cost, as we all are saying, that the infrastructure development is the major one. See, we are uh, skewed towards the 60 to 65% of the road transport. Whereas in developed countries or China, if you see, they are having that to the tune of 30 to 35% only. So what they are using, they are using waterways, they are using rail transport board to reduce the uh, road transport, which is an expensive one. Uh, I can share my, uh, my, my experience when I was traveling in China in 2000, 
1750 to 70 uh, in the interior part, uh, very seldom you find trucks or cars on road on the highways. Because the uh, waterways are being used majorly in coal transport also because we are uh, importing around 25% of our requirement of coal. So in coal transport also if you see they use waterways, they use waterways for the containerized cargoes also. So that gives advantage to them in two ways. One, the cost is reduced. Second, the speed is also there. The reach is also there. So my, in my wish list, if you ask, uh, multimodal transport should be increased. Waterway we are talking about and we should be very fast on that. Second, the major ports. Uh, today, you know, the if you uh, compare the number of capsized vessels coming to India versus other part of the uh, world, we are at a very lower level. So that, to increase that, we have to invest in the major ports. That is the second one. Then third is the cost competitiveness in logistics, which will definitely come, because today we are going forward for blending of ethanol to the tune of 20%. So that benefit should come somewhere to the logistic industry also. Third thing is partnering logistic companies and bring international investment in that. So consolidation of the part. Today we are fragmented. Uh, we are having uh, transport companies with two or three fleet size also. Uh, if we compare again with the China, uh, China is moving global in investing to the in the uh, other countries uh, in logistic parks and logistic development whereas in india we are we want you know, international community to come and invest so that is a third part from my side and regulation we spoke about that uh, we want to work on the regulative things uh, to curtail the uh, number of checks and uh, things in the, in the system and i am happy to hear that government is very keen on that and definitely, as, as an industry, we can say that we are hopeful that this wish list will be uh, fulfilled very quickly and uh, we will also partner into it. Fantastic. Great. Thank you so much for putting it across very articulately. So, Mihir, I think you, uh, you, know, you have been involved on part of the regulation side, some of it on the... On the so, uh, you are seeing it very closely up front, both at state and centre. So would you, would you like to tell us, you know, which are the highest impact changes in regulation that you have seen in the near time? And what, you know, you would say that what would really help moving forward in the context of LPI. So could you give us some inputs on that? Yeah, sure. So I think uh, specifically from a regulatory perspective and uh, I think as my colleague will actually bring the reality on ground in terms of whether that's making sense or not. But I think you know, only day before yesterday, if I'm not wrong, Government of India, you know, kind of came out with NLP, National uh, Logistics Marine Portal. Uh, a number of digital initiatives on customs, ISGATE, uh, e-logs now for getting, you know, grievances on board. Uh, a lot of focus on policy. Government of India obviously came out with the National Logistics Policy. It is now hand-holding states to come out with their own policy documents, addressing things that really matter in the industry. I'll give you an example. I was part of a conversation, I won't name the state, but the state really took the proactive step of actually having all the large investors in the room while it was going through every word of the policy document. What should be the height of the warehouse? Should it be 12 meters, should it be 9 meters? What it means from a fire regulation perspective? What does the private sector want? I think that level of focus has gone into regulation of policy making. And I think that really will ensure that what you write and what you, you know, what the government wants to do and what's happening on the ground are very similar. That gap will reduce. So, yes, Mr. Mulligan, and you mentioned that the gap is there, but I think the proactive nature of collaboration that the government is trying to do across layers. Uh, for example, and I think this Pramod from GIZ sitting in the room, they are doing fantastic work on, you know, smart enforcement. I think Pritam, you're also looking at that or, or larger warehousing standards like you, know, you, you obviously are the champion on that. So I think there are multiple domains in which regulatory process and policy improvements are happening. The change that is happening is now collaborative. Uh, therefore the gap is certainly reduced. And time will tell and I think more forums like this will help the government also.
also identifies whether the gap is increasing or and things like LPI will tell you a mirror, you know, which whether whether it's actually working or not. So all of us are like waiting for the next release of the LPI to see whether everything that is being talked about is actually resulting in something meaningful. Uh, so I think that's it's great to watch. I would say, we've done a lot of work. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. So just quickly, you know, I'll touch on a few things. Uh, one is on the regulatory aspect, and secondly is the engagement of the industry. So as uh, uh, the person introducing me said that I am also the president of the Warehousing Association of India. And the last couple of years I've been working with different uh, departments and officers in the, in the government of India. And uh, we, we were always part of the interaction uh, with in, in formulating finally the national logistics policy. And uh, more recently, uh, Warehousing Association of India uh, defined and established the standards for warehousing in India, which was launched uh, on the day of the National Logistics Policy by uh, Sri Prime Minister Modi. Uh, and uh, so that was a great start. And uh, what I want to say is that the first time I'm seeing a government engaging across industry uh, to get a feedback before actually putting policies in place. And if any uh, tweaking of policies required, they take a positive feedback from trade and industry. Unlike earlier times that you know they, that some people would actually define the policy and then business has to work around that policy and comply with it, whether it is efficient, inefficient, or you know, indifferent. Uh, but this is a huge change, and I've seen it very close up. And, uh, and now, you know, a lot of government agencies are coming forward to engage with trade and industry saying, please give us your views. In fact, if you are aware that they have posted the national logistics policy on the government portal for more than two years, inviting feedback from trade. And then some of that feedback which was received was, you know, assimilated and then they made some changes along the line. So what I want to say is that uh, we are on a, on a, on a the country is, is, is on a threshold of transformation. Uh, another example I will tell you is that this transformation is being driven from the top. A few years ago, at this, uh, just before COVID, I was in a closed body meeting and had the opportunity to meet Mr. Gadkari, who was uh, you know, uh, road transport minister, and he was discussing about the highway and, and how much they are made. And in that meeting, there were about 20 or 25 people he just made a statement that, you know, by 2025, this percentage of vehicles will be electric. It, it was not planned, it was not part of his agenda speech. And we had some very senior leaders from the automotive industry and all stakeholders present. Some of them actually stood up and said, sir, did I hear you correctly? Because, you know, there were so many uh, automotives who have just come into the country with new plants preparing, for, they were preparing for BS4 compliance, all right? And because India, as you know, jumped frog, uh, frog jumped from BS2 straight to BS4, and now we're going into BS6, all right, in terms of, you know, uh, the, the fuel level. And so when they heard this, you know, there were many companies who were actually putting few thousand crores in new plant upgrades to transform from BS4 and short transformation into BS6. So that was actually uh, something out of the blue. And you know, some of us couldn't believe that India can actually make this transformation. But if you look at it, I'm now talking about three, between three and a half years to now, everybody's talking about EV. So many uh, companies that were making, you know, uh, cars designed for petrol and, fuel and, and, and diesel, they are now re-engineering their plans. They are putting in new plants, and it's all hybrid, and they're now talking about hydrogen fuels. So if you see, India is really making huge steps in progress, right? You take the story of the mobile phones, and I remember, you know, till 10 years ago, you had to wait a few months before you were a landline. Today, you can walk into the store and walk out with your SIM card. And India has a new leap from from 2G technology, we got straight into 4G and now we are heading into 5G. So I think we have made some fantastic progress in a short period. And, 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 uh, and it's great to be working with the government 
where you know uh, they they are listening to what industry says. They are aware of uh, you know what the business requirements are to actually catapult India into the world place, right? So when we talk about global supply chains and China plus one, we are also getting ready from that from every aspect, whether it's technology, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's training, skill development, sustainability, all those parameters are being covered. So I actually like to you know. Uh, commend the government uh, in, in their efforts and I think all of us who are stakeholders in this supply chain have a role to play and uh, you know having worked in, in the CIA and as a chair and national logistics policies and all of that uh, we carved out this warehousing association of India right simply because I met somebody who said you you have to stop complaining that government is not doing this government is not doing that what are you doing to contribute which dovetails into the greater vision of the country? And I stood back and I said, yes, the time has come. We as stakeholders have to stop complaining. Maybe the progress is not as fast as we want it to be. But what can we do to hasten the progress? Can we partner the government? Can we give new ideas? Can we participate in you know uh, uh, the hackathons which they do to see how can we help transform India? So I am going to pause here, sir, and we have a great expert from uh, from the freight forwarding industry who will tell us about his experience then and now in terms of custom clearance, spaceless clearance, ice gate, and everything else that you have to say, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, the fundamental main thing is that uh, approach. This government approach is very positive approach, right? Even really single association trade body, they wanted to hear from them. And uh, take a recent example, yesterday we had the budget. Now Madam Neeraman Sitaraman is traveling across the India to get the feedbacks about the budget. Tomorrow we have a meeting with them in Mumbai. So we are preparing what feedbacks we should give from the industry side. And uh, uh, as I said, we should commend, as you saw, we should commend this government and all ministries, 11 ministries, they are lobbied in the NLP including uh, shipping road and uh, all ministries, the Ministry of Finance and this. So, but for the betterment of their issuing the public notices uh, and uh, circulars, but whether those are circulars are implemented at wrong level, that is need we to think. And whatever I am suggesting, these are the suggestions, not complaints. Right? So, if you talk about this single window, it, it is fantastic for uh, industry to grow and to be in the top 25 at uh, 2030. But single window, whether all PGS are included in that, integrated in that. Yes, integrated, but are they functioning well? It's a question mark. So we need so you say uh, uh, FASI and uh, the ADC, NOC. Still we have to wait for three to four days for to get the reports after sending the samples. So what uh, sir told about, we told about this average years is about uh, 16 hours in air and uh, 48 hours in sea. It's still average years is uh, 72 hours. Right? And we are aiming at 12 hours in air and we are aiming at 24 hours in by field. Whether it is happening, <coughs> no, it's not happening at all. Regarding, well, we said the upper level part, right? And it has uh, changed the focus from the import <coughs> to the export sector. Now, and we are we are having a lot of companies coming in because of this government positive approach. We are seeing many outside industries they are coming and setting in India. Deeply, direct port delivery is a good move to save the time and uh, save the money. But what about DPE, direct port entry? It's export when we are consisting on export more. So the, whatever we are clearing the exports, still it takes a lot of time to get in, into, into the port. It's all the vehicles they have to park at their parking plaza or going to the CFSL or the getting the late export orders. So there are a lot of issues in this DPE. But again I say the approach of the government is fantastic. So how to work out, how to get this reduced timing from uh, let us put orders to get in and uh, loading on the vessels. We had several meetings and uh, all major cities, ports, Cochin, Mumbai, Mundra, 
we are getting feedbacks and we are, these feedbacks we are giving to the government how to reduce the time. AOs is another, uh, we spoke about AOs, the right? authorized economy, where there should be immediately, the clearance should be immediately, but what system selects, it's still 24 to 30% system selects for physical examination. <coughs> so the purpose of defeat, uh, AU is defeating over here. RMS facility, it's a good thing that uh, system is selecting what type of uh, goods to be examined. Earlier days it was 60%, now it, from 60% to 80% it has gone on. So 80% of the goods are being RMS, no examination. But at the same time when we are going to take the deliveries, then suddenly we know that we have to examine the goods, we have to open the goods and containers and all. So again, purpose of the RMS is fitting. The, the other, other, other is the faceless assessment. Many industries, many people, they say faceless is a Faceless. But faceless is also working fantastically, subject to the few, see, for the 2% of the people, 98% are suffering. For the two people, you know, even in faceless, they have got so many smuggled goods, contraband, uh, they were found. So government is saying, okay, 98%, we don't worry about 98%, but we are worried about 2%. Who do we have mischievous? They are smelling the gold, they are smelling the mobiles. Even now, twice also they are smuggled. Can you imagine the twice also being smuggled and they are, they are being kept with the other goods so that twice should not be examined and other goods can be cleared and it should be clear. So again, faceless, there is an issue. Then we talk about digital, digital clearances. Very commendable job by the Ministry of Commerce and the DJ system and the CBIC system. Can you imagine when our boys were going to the docks for the registration of the goods, for the examination of the goods, and they taking the deliveries, all I can. All this you can do from your office, right? You can register goods from your office. You can you can get after examination, you can get this uh, in uh, soft copies of bills of entry that can be, and that goes to importers also. See, earlier what we used to say to the importers that, Sir, goods are under examination. And two days, three days, continuous import was falling with the customer workers. But nothing has been changed. Importers in sitting their offices in their cabin, they can see what uh, position of these consignments are there. Whether the glow is assessed, examination, duty payment is fantastic. Online duty payment, <coughs> you can pay, uh, pay the duty within two, uh, two minutes online. So these are the great uh, things done by the Ministry of Commerce and CBIC. Regarding, I, I, I said uh, registration of goods from uh, your offices in, in case of imports. What about exports? The system there should be there that uh, trade can register their goods from exports. The one main challenge for the <coughs> trade is, for the, especially for the exporter is, there is no mechanism system in the uh, in system, say, <coughs> I said, where the importer can obtain their uh, 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 the mistakes, whatever their custom broker had done online. No, still in case of export I'm talking about, still they have many uh, amendment certificates are being issued by the custom and uh, many times DJT don't accept those certificates. So there should be some mechanism in the ISGATE so that amendments can be done on hotel. These are the highlights, there are many, if I talk, it will take up two hours. So these are the main highlights. Thank you, sir. Thank you for summing up so well. I'm just going to keep the last five minutes open to the house. Any, uh, anybody want to comment on, on the technology side and the infrastructure side on some of the pain points that he mentioned? Anybody like to take a shot? Yeah. You know, I think uh, you know, I really emphasize the fact that you know, the digital transformation is several years. Yeah, so uh, you know, I emphasize with just a couple of points. All of this is working progress. I think the most important thing about technology is that, sir, you will appreciate is that we have these dark spots of accountability. Right? Take, for example, the delay. <coughs> if, if an online system, you know precisely at which state it is stuck, it is mapping which officer is responsible for it, and therefore passing the buck has going to stop. So, what the national analysis this is from what Vinkir also mentioned. Manuji, is that we used to have this concept called time-release studies. It's still there. 
Unless I think it's accountability. But the time release study was only limited to the customs part of the work. With the National Maritime Portal, what this will do is that in your entire clearance chain, and this is something we as in the private sector will have to appreciate. Sometimes we are the people responsible for the events. It's, you know, it's, it's a sequence of events that have to follow. And not everybody always does the sequence in an efficient manner. Sometimes the private sector is also wanting. What the National Maritime Portal will do is it will fix accountability not only on the regulatory stakeholders in this whole chain, but also on the terminals. Because for a long time, just like JNPT, one of the worst challenges there was in the hinterland, the parking lot. Something as simple as the parking lot management was leading to huge delays. So again, we need to, you know, it's a partnership, you know, as we did mention, as you mentioned, it's a partnership. One last point on the stakeholder thing, you know, having been in many committees from both sides and having gone as an industry member, one mistake that we always used to, when I feel we used to make, is we go with the laundry list. Let's not go with the laundry list. You know, it was when everybody, all of us started saying parking lot, parking lot, parking lot, it got resolved. So, you know, take that one thing that is the, you know, Biggest problem, shout from the you know, rooftops and government business. That is one thing. Thank you. Can I add something? Oh, yes, please. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you totally. Then we studied that 72 hours, I said, in case of exports. So, Minister of Commerce, CBSE, they said that you study why it is taken 72 hours. <coughs> so we found that 24 hours are taking time by the importers to pay the duty. Because, because they have got to go to the process, they will submit this uh, information to the force department, account department will tally, and then make a check and pay the duty. <laughs> so now, this, uh, this panel, we are working on it. And how to reduce this from 72 hours. So I, I totally agree with the accountability that importers are also accountable to in the 72 hours. So we, we need to take into consideration also. So totally agree with this. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So uh, I'm going to open this to the house for questions. Uh, please go ahead, sir. A bit of a comment and a less of a question. I think a lot of it has been answered. Firstly, 10 upon 10 to the government to reach the bottom for policy formulation. Implementation, the pain is there. Terrible pain. Let me tell you one thing. I'll give you a simple example. Besides other things, uh, I don't want to sabotage the heading of this discussion of coming down in LPI. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation. I have also done a talk earlier on that. Uh, main thing is I want to improve my logistic efficiency to reduce that cost from 13% to 8 to 9%, which I think has been highlighted. The pain at the bottom, uh, today, the, again, the government, the bottom edge of the, the secretary and the minister and the prime minister are there. <coughs> Somebody at the bottom has to be held accountable on a daily basis daily basis. And that accountability does not have to be asked from a senior officer. It has to be asked from the industry. Because otherwise I've been on that, I also want to look after him and you know cover it with good English. That is, okay, examples. Examples. We go from here to Jaipur on the National Highway. On the culture side, this is on the industry side. Three load carriers will be racing with each other at 45 kilometers an hour. And my car is left to dodge from here. So the co-driver, a truck seat co-driver, you know, we have a co-driver, by the way, we have to do it, we have to do it, Now, Gadkari can keep making highways, if the trucks are going to behave like this, it's a no. Second, every place wonderful bypass is made. But it has only taken two, three years for Dhabal to come out. Why can't we have rest area if it is on that Agra expressway there? So these are uh, not investment incentive, intensive, and uh, I also heard uh, you saying, you know, state government. Now, half the punching is between center and the state. Somebody, maybe the industry can connect it. And I I don't find any excuse. He is not doing it. I could have done it, but he is not doing it. And I, uh, the boy, you should tell, if you blame him, I am going to sack So you go, touch his feet, give him a bottle of whiskey, tell him that they do. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Very early point. So just uh, to, you know, on this, the central state stuff, I, I've had some personal experience because uh, warehousing, which is uh, my pet topic, the land is actually the state subject. 
And so while we are pitching with national logistics policy at national level, implementation, a lot of it is dependent on, uh, on uh, you know, the, the states. So what we have requested the central government is that why don't we make, you know, a minimum value proposition, MVP plan of a framework for warehousing. And then we will work with the states that out of, let's say, 10 aspects of that, maybe five are common to all states in India. And then five points can be dealt with at the state level based on how they want to incentivize the industry and all. So we are, and the government is sort of, uh, you know, I think that's what we've done. For example, the handbook is basically a framework, right? And then adoption of that depends on the state. So we have also been working with the center to actually make it, uh, we can't make it, let's say, uh, compulsory for state to give industry status to warehousing, right? Because there are a lot of benefits flowing if, if you get industry status. Right now, we are considered as a commercial activity. But in the last two years or three years, six states have actually given industry status, right? So they are, uh, they are putting a model framework at the center and then partnering the state to actually implement. So absolutely, like you said, we have to stop battling. We have to partner center and state and their industry and industry bodies have a role to play. So uh, any other point, questions? Yes, sir, please. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. I need a mic. Or is it, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. Good afternoon. I'm Jay Mishra from Audubon Technologies. We are basically aggregators for warehousing. Sir. So I'm just taking, you know, sharing your pain. I'm new to the business, but the, this startup is about three and a half years old. We aggregate warehouses on a pan India basis. And we find that uh, compliance levels are extremely low in the existing warehousing infrastructure, largely due to government regulation. Now, there is a huge overcapacity of warehousing, and the clients who are now come looking for warehousing, the big corporates, are looking at compliance levels. So, the existing warehouses are getting redundant. It's a huge source of, I mean, it's, it, it's it's a setup infrastructure which may, may not be utilized as much. We find that almost 70% of the warehouses which are not meeting the compliance levels of large corporates are lying vacant. Now we try and enable you know, occupancy of these warehouses anywhere in India. But the issue is that because of these compliances or regularization of existing warehouses, their usability is very low. So the infrastructure is getting wasted. Compliant warehouses which the large corporates are looking at will definitely be more expensive, leading to higher cost of you know, logistics. The other thing is, sorry, hello. The other thing I was trying to say is that, uh, I think I've just missed the point, but there is a huge need or a huge attention required to the warehousing sector in terms of aggregating it. Great, so, you know, we can take it offline, but just to tell you that, like yourself, uh, you know, we've also been working with the government and we are doing the geosp geospatial mapping of warehouses across India, and there are a few portals where there are around 20,000 warehouses on board. And this is all going to feed into, you know, the uh, the ULIP as well as Dati Shakti. So that's in a different way. You and I can take it offline, uh, and I'm, I'm sure we can work around it because we are starting the grading, rating, and improvement of warehouses under Y. So all these warehouses which are not being utilized and need to be uplifted, we, you can work with some of our consultants and Y, but it will help upgrade to a great warehouse. So why don't we take it offline? Thank you.